Hi guys, so I've uh, got a request here from KPRIM14 uh, who commented on my KL Bangkok you know, uh, drive video and uh, he said kindly review the Honda Accord 8 Gen as I'm considering to own one. So the 8th Gen Accord is, uh, that's the one that became the second generation Padana. So, all right, here you go. Here comes the review. So, um, the 8th Gen Accord was launched in Malaysia in 2008. That, that actually predated my entry into this industry. So, by the time I joined this industry, uh, the 8th Gen Accord was already, I think, about 2 or 3 years old. Uh, but still, I had the, the Accord was one of the first few cars that I had the opportunity to review. And it was mid-2009, we did an event in Auto World, we did an event, a defensive driving class. And uh, Honda was one of, was our event partner, they lent us a few cars for, for, uh, to use in the, in, as, as demo. And uh, amongst them were the, uh, the court both in 2 liter and 2.4 liter configurations. So um, I did a, did a, did a review comparing the Accord 2.0 versus the 2.4. The initial objective of this test was to see if the base 2.0 VTI is good enough to meet your needs or if the 2.4 should really be the one to go for. Now at that time, so initially when they launched the, the 8th Gen Accord, there was either the 2.0 VTI or the 2.4 VTI L, right? Just these two. Then just before this article was written in uh, July 2009, uh, Honda also added a 2.0 VTIL. That's the, that's a, sort of like a mid-spec model, and I think that variant would go on to become uh, the the most important variant in that Accord lineup because it has most of the features from the 2.4 model. But you get the uh, you 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 get the lower running costs and road tax of the two liter model. So at that time, I commented when this latest Accord was renewed revealed last year. Um, Honda presented the biggest and boldest looking car to wear the Accord nameplate. And yes, actually, yeah, that was right because at that time when they launched that that uh that eight gen accord that car was huge okay and when you know when pro and finally now when proton used that car as basis for the padana they stretched it even longer uh the this this gen accord was i think about 4.9 meters in length the padana was up to five meters in length so it's a very long car very big car uh and it's very sharply star if you remember all right so um definitely um it had it had that stature, that size, and at the same time, it also had aggression in its design. So after the the event concluded, I went home in the Accord 2.4, and next day I swapped with the two liter model. When I wrote this, I was brand I was still very new in in the business. There are a lot of things inside this article that. <laughs> okay, uh, I say the dashboard combines a good style, a good deal of style and practicality. Uh, which is still true about about uh, about Honda cars in general, all right. Ergonomics and build quality of the Accord almost impeccable. Steering wheel adjusts for reach and rake. Buttons on the dashboard controlling the dual zone uh, aircon and audio unit possess very good tactile feel when operated. Problem lies in figuring out how to operate them. Although it proved easy enough upon familiarization, the sheer amount of buttons on the dash make first-time users feel 
as if as they are trying to access a supercomputer for the less tech savvy the cluttered dashboard can seem intimidating yes so if you remember the that gen air court right the center dash had it's like a button fest on the center dash and at one glance that thing looks like wow you know what's what's going on here but as you as you familiarize yourself with them the layout becomes uh intuitive enough to use and you know and and after i think after after driving up for a few minutes right i was like i will uh, i very quickly familiarized myself with the layout of the cabin and that's generally true every time when i drive a honda car uh i sit in there within five ten minutes pop you know i'm all familiar with the cabin ready to go so that's one thing that uh till today honda does um very very well with their with their with their interior design in terms of the fit and finish not very impressive perhaps but ergonomics uh, Honda is usually on the ball so uh, as I drove off in the 2.4 I was immediately impressed at how the car's massive bulk seemed to shrink around me it gathered pace with serene ease changed direction with such agility uh, you don't expect from a front wheel driven sedan of such massive proportions. Approaching long sweeping bends, ease a little upon entry, then gun the throttle on apex, you'll be astonished at how it just grips and goes. For sharper corners, call, uh, calling the pedal shifters into action enables you to summon more traction from the lower gears to keep you in line. Now, I have to admit that this was written before I had driven cars like the Mondeo, Suzuki Kizashi, but I, th I do remember at that time, this being one of the first few cars that I drove, I was quite impressed. Uh, I, I was quite impressed with it. Um, I drove the 2.4 that night. I think I remember I, that coming from USJ, that long sweeping tunnel going into Subang SS14, um, I gunned it around that bend and, and, that, and that was the impression that was in my head when I crafted that paragraph before. Um, I noticed also, I noted also that the steering wheel was accurate but it filters out a lot of a lot of feedback. So um that's generally been true of many Honda steering setups in recent times. I have little doubt that the chassis engineers at Honda placed handling at the top of the list ahead of even comfort. This is because on 2.4 a substantial amount of road undulations were transmitted to the cabin. Indicate a stiff suspension setup so the next day uh, I swapped the 2.4 for the 2 liter model and one thing about the Accord 2 liter model uh, those rims the 16 inch wheels that Honda specified for the Accord 2.0 at the time uh, it's uh, very very unattractive looking and equipment wise the 2.0 VTI is really really down on kit compared to the 2.4 um it had fabric seats not that i mind fabric seats i like fabric seats but uh, i don't think a d7 sedan these days can get away with fabric seats anymore uh at the 2.0 had a two-tone interior scheme all right 2.4 had all black the 2.0 had a two-tone black on beige color so those days um when i was younger probably don't appreciate it but now when i look back right a, you know, a light color scheme actually uh, it gives the cabin a more airy feel. It's a more welcoming ambiance. The 2.0 Accord also loses uh, cruise control. That's fine, but what's shocking, All right? And and I totally forgot about this is that uh, the 2.0 does not have variable intermittent wipers. You know, it's that fun. You know, when you have your wipers, right? You have off, you have intermittent one, two. Many cars, the intermittent setting, you can additionally set the intervals, right? Whether you want it fast in between or you want it longer. So with the Accord, they actually deleted that intermittent uh, adjustment feature in the two liter model. Wow. Um, the two liter doesn't have pedal shifters. And funnily enough, the way Honda lays out the transmission selector it's for if you don't have pedal shifters it's park reverse neutral drive remember the the, the court has a five-seat automatic right drive 
then it's three to one there is no option for you to manually select fourth gear uh, at that time i was a bit annoyed with it but i think this day and age it's not something that bothers me because these days when you put me in a car with two pedals i just want to leave the thing in d and just drive uh, performance wise though the accord 2.0 uh was quite a surprise all right um it's not faster it's slower than the 2.4 yes but the two liter engine um has has a bit more enthusiasm in the way it revs and the way it pulls all right uh an interesting contrast on the the, the 2.0 had a single overhead camshaft engine from the R series family, all right, that's shared, that is derived from the Civic 1.8 engine. Whereas the 2.4 had a twin cam engine from the K series family. So, so the behavior of those two engines are significantly different. And uh, in a way, it is the two liter engine that's a bit more satisfying, a bit more engaging to to drive compared to the 2.4 and it is in the context of these segment rivals at that time it's not slow at all but i also do remember that the 2.4 was a very high strung engine and you need to rev the engine hard in order to get it to really perform there's more body roll in the two liter because the 2.4 has a stiffer suspension setup and it also has a, has a strut bar uh but funnily enough i observed that the two liter has a bit better steering feedback compared to the 2.4 i think i said that i like the 2.4 a lot but the two liter model was was a revelation and uh and i think that driving characteristics that performance when you put it in the vtil model so in terms of pricing right the base model 2.0 Kosong spec car, 142,000 ringgit, whereas the 2.4 was 172,000 ringgit. The the uh, the 2.0 VTIL was 152,000 ringgit, so 10,000 more than the VT the 2. the base 2.0. But it comes with most of the things that 2.4 gets and hardly an inferior driving experience. So definitely, uh, it is. The 2.0 VTIL, even though it was not driven in this specific test, but uh, just by comparing the engine behavior and the, and the spec sheet, right, it's clear that the 2.0 VTIL was the pick of the range with the, with the uh, Accord. Anyways, just to run down some numbers, back then the 2.0 pumped out what, 154 horsepower, 189 newton meters of torque, whereas the 2.4 made... 178 horsepower, 222 newton meters of torque. Not substantial numbers these days, but uh, back then, I think that's that's the segment standard. So later that year, when when Honda gave us the 2.0 VTIL, uh, I actually managed to arrange for Toyota to lend me the uh, the Camry 2.0 G as well. So that was my first time driving the Camry, uh, that generation of the Camry. It was the it's the what they call the Camry XV50. I think it's that that to me until today. Uh, no, I think before today, lah. Uh, it's one of the best Camrys in the, uh, that that Toyota has made. All right, that that was one of the that was the one the Camry that I think really established the Camry as a proper alternative. You know, to a German luxury car without feeling cheap. So the Accord Camry versus Camry battle is fought on three fronts, the entry-level variants, 
the mid spec variance and the full spec variance. So the entry level and mid spec variance that I mentioned there, uh, they are two liter models, whereas the full specs are 2.4 versus 2.4. It is worth noting that each variant of the Accord undercuts the equivalent Camry's price by a few thousand ringgit. Yeah, because at that time, the Accord was locally assembled, whereas the Camry is fully imported. So that's why the Camry comes a little bit more expensive. So for this feature, I pitted the the Camry 2.0 uh, the, the G against the Accord 2.0 VTIL. So we start with the with the with the Accord, all right. So if you if you if you choose, so we now elaborate here. If you choose the two point zero VTIL versus the two point four VTIL, uh, you lose the front strut bar. You you don't you lose leather steering wheel. You lose pedal shifters, side airbags, and oh my God, did you drop VSA? Ah? Those days, those days it was still acceptable for a D segment car to not have VSA as standard and yeah that is right this generation the Accord 2 liter did not have VSA and that is a legacy that was carried over to the Padana because Proton uh, is unable to implement stability control in the Padana 2 liter model because Accord never because Honda never made it available in the Accord in the first place so the 2.0 VTIL also makes do with halogen headlights but you get uh you get leather seats uh electric driver seat adjustment and cruise control which the base accord does not get now in the camry the mid-spec model actually loses less equipment compared to the top spec model so you only lose keyless start which at that time you can still do but now no way uh you lose the steering, the wood finish on the steering, which is fine, and also you also lose stability control. And uh, the difference, right? Be the difference here from the 2.0 G to 2.4 V is about twenty thousand ringgit. All right, but between uh, the two of them, between uh, the Accord versus the Camry, right? Mid spec to mid spec, the Camry. Camry at mid spec level gets auto head, uh, HID headlights, get uh, passenger powers, uh, electric passenger seat. You get a trip computer. Okay, yeah, that generation Accord did not have like a multi info display in the instrument cluster yet. You get intermittent variable wipers. So they they all, Honda also did not bother to put intermittent variable wipers in uh, variable intermittent wipers in the Accord two point VTIL and parking front parking sensors. So in terms of outputs, the uh, Accord 2.0, 154 horsepower, 189 newton meters, whereas the Camry, 145 horsepower, 190 newton meters of torque. Transmission, Accord four, uh, 5 speeds versus Camry's 4 speed. And uh, suspension, they are caught, this generation Accord had front double wishbones, so that is a, that is a big plus point. But of course, the trade-off is you get uh, there is a you, there's a bit more wear and tear to deal with in terms of worn bushings and all. So multi links at the back. Remember, uh, even before this, uh, Honda once upon a time gave all round double wishbones for their cords. So that was a period even earlier on, right? Especially in the nineties, I think that that the Accord really established itself as a segment leader in handling because of its all-round double wishbone setup. So Toyota also gave, gives you an all-independent suspension setup, but um, it is a sim much simpler design, McPherson struts up front, a dual-link suspension at the back. Uh, but body size, the cord is taller, wider, longer, and also has a longer wheelbase, and lower weight than the Camry. Being cars designed for the masses, uh, drying either of them are painless affairs, but as you would expect, it is the Accord that provides the more engaging drive. Here, the added sophistication of the Honda's chassis and drivetrain gives the Accord maximum advantage over the Camry. And the difference is felt the moment you slot into D and go. As you step on the accelerator from standstill, 
the Accord lurches forward and powers away, the tachometer flicking itself to its peak torque mark at 4,300 revs before upshifting. Me, the Camry meanwhile simply jogs off the mark and inches away with minimal drama. So despite being a single cam, the Accord's R20A uh, loves high revs far more than the Camry's uh, lazier 1AZ FE motor. Even though the Camry also picks up pace quite rapidly, it just isn't as fun to drive and we haven't taken it to the corners yet. On winding roads, keen drivers would definitely prefer the Accord's more communicative and, chass and confidence-inspiring chassis. Although the Camry is also a competent handler, its steering and pedal have so much feedback distilled out, you're really running on guesswork as to the status of the car's grip levels. It's This is a very, in terms of handling, uh, definitely this generation Camry is a very, very, very far cry from the current TNGA platform Camry. Uh, and yeah, and quite, quite, uh, quite ironic to see that now, in this current model generation, I think in terms of handling, on, on the grounds of handling alone, I would easily rank the Camry as a superior choice to the Accord. The Camry is the one that now has double wishbone suspension, but it's at the back. Back on the straights, the differences are less conclusive. Keener drives a better appreciate the Accord's smoother revving power plants. Uh, although it gets a little floaty past 140 km per hour, in contrast, it is the Camry that feels more stable and planted even if the tackle is taking a few more revs. This is because of the ratio spread. Uh, the Camry has a narrower, ra uh, narrower spread of ratios and uh, it's, it's a, it, it's the gearing of the Camry is also shorter than that of the Accord. And at that time, I actually took the effort to time the 0 to 100 acceleration for both cars. And they were just within 0 0.1 seconds of each other. But 80 to 120 kilometers per hour, right? Um, the Camry needed 8.6 seconds to go from 80 to 120 kilometers per hour, whereas the Accord needed 9.6 seconds. So uh, my suspicion at the time is that because the how I did it was uh, transmission and drive, just step. It was also to test how how well the transmission responds to kick down. So. Um, and yeah, so I think it's because this one, in this case, the Camry made use of its shorter rate, shorter gearing to give you more instantaneous uh, in-gear acceleration. Whereas with the Accord, because it has a five-speed transmission, you want to accelerate, you need to give it the transmission time to shift down before it goes. Better acceleration times does not make the Camry a better drive. The Accord's keener revving engine and superbly agile chassis ensures that it remains the driver's choice. Passengers will of course better appreciate riding in the Camry with its comfort-oriented chassis and classy interior. While the Accord flattens out body roll well, the Camry's simpler suspension cushions out potholes with equal effectiveness. The Accord is definitely the more enjoyable car to drive, but the Camry is the better choice to ferry passengers. On long highway cruises, driving the Camry also proved to be a less tiring affair. Deciding on which is the better car boils down to a matter of perspective. As a passenger, my preference would be to ride in the Camry. But if asked to take the wheel, I'd go for the Accord. So that's my verdict at the time. And in 2011, uh, Honda facelifted this generation of the Accord, and uh, I was I had a chance to review both the two-liter and the 2.4 model. So in this one, right, the uh, 
For the facelift, Honda ditched the 3.5 litre V6 flagship. And let's see what do I have here. So in, in, in this review, I mentioned that firstly, the 2 litre models get uh get a greater proportion of of uh of equipment that was previously exclusive to the 2.4 so now they put leather finishing around the steering and the gear knob they add front parking sensors uh you now get variable intermittent wipers as well <laughs> um, but they still kept the ugly rim designs for the 2.0 model you also have the option to spec modular body kits on the car but I don't see why anybody would have wanted to spend the money at the time. So the pricing, 150,000 ringgit for the mid-spec model, the 2.0 VTI L. The base 2.0 VTI is 7,000 ringgit cheaper. The 2.4 costs 23,000 ringgit more. So immediately, as before, the 2.0 VTI L is definitely the sweet spot of the range. This is, this is an interesting paragraph that I wrote. Stacked against the competition, we realized that Honda could have improved the Accord's equipment count a bit. Uh, the crowded center stack may give you the impression that the Accord is lavishly equipped. Its kit count excludes a number of features that we have come to take for granted in this price range. To start with, it's been a while since we picked up a test car that does not read its own fuel consumption. So the Accord is not generously equipped, but Honda makes up by blessing it with one of the best sorted chassis setups in this segment. Front double wishbones, rear multi-links, Despite being quite easily the largest car in this market segment, the Accord is very agile. Some may find its ride a little stiff. Its composed body control when making sharp directional changes is impressive. It's not quite in the same league as the Ford Mondeo, uh, but the big Ford is sadly underrated and largely ignored in our parts of the world. Amongst big volume rivals, only the Tiana comes close to matching the Accord's dynamic prowess. But the Tiana is even more stingy with equipment where the 2-litre model is concerned. Yeah, that generation of the Tiana, the 2-litre model, um, it's, it's, it's really very embarrassingly equipped. I actually find the 2-litre versions to be more enjoyable than the 2.4. Um, although the smaller engine lacks the bigger numbers, it makes up for the deficit with an eager throttle response. Uh, this engine is shared with the Honda CRE, but not the Civic 2.0, which gets the K20A twin cam in uh, instead. Now, uh, it is how related to the R18A engine used by the Civic 1.8. Yep, so I was referring, of course, to the Civic FD at that time. The 154 horsepower engine forms an excellent partnership with Honda's in house 5 speed automatic transmission. This well worked drivetrain setup shows that getting a transmission right. It's all about selecting the right ratios and intelligent programming. It makes the Camry 2.0's 4-speed auto feel antiquated and the Sonata's 6 speeders seem like overkill. One major improvement made to the Honda, made to the Accord addresses a well-known criticism leveled at Honda cars of recent years, which is poor sound insulation. Compared to the pre model, road noise has been eliminated and wind noise similarly well muffled, no longer being a hindrance to conversation at high speed. So updates to the Accord in this facelift have not made have not improved it by sufficient margins to cause any stir in the market, but the original product strength means that Honda will still have a huge say in this segment. Amongst its segment front runners, that is the Camry, the Tiana, the Sonata, uh, the Accord is still the best driver's car, and that alone will ensure it maintains its loyal legion of fans, and most importantly for Honda, its market share. So later on, I reviewed the 2.4. Barring the Nissan Tiana's 2.5 liter V6 motor, this is probably the smoothest revving power plant in its market range. After the IV tap opens at 4,000 RPM, there's no stopping its charge to 7,000. But lower down the rev range, however, things are a little less urgent. This is one of those engines that you need to constantly gun in order to extract its best performance. Honda's in-house five-speed auto pairs well with the motor being responsive to throttle inputs as well as triggering of its shift pedals. There were however situations that the transmission was powerless to mask flat spots of the engine's torque curve down low. That lack of explosive on-demand acceleration from the 2000 to 3000 RPM range means overtaking on trunk roads require careful planning and constant boiling of the engine above 4000 RPM. Not that it seemed to mind that one bit by the way. 
Neither did it seem to mind being chucked about on winding roads right from the start. The current gen Accord has been noted for its superior handling, handling characteristics. Honda has been wise to leave that unchanged. Weight and feedback of controls are well judged and overall composure of the chassis is evident at most speeds. By the time this car starts to feel nervous on a straight line, you can be very sure you are straying very close to the double ton mark. The Accord is still one of the better driving cars in the market segment, despite precious little changes. Uh, yeah, adjustment remains unchanged after testing the more powerful 2.0 VTIL, but in my mind at least, the 2.0 is still better buy and simply more fun to drive. So that's uh, that's my review of the Accord uh, 8th Gen at the time. So today, uh, how much does what do one of these cost in the market? So let's look at 2008 to 2013 on the Accord. We don't care 2.0 or 2.4 lah. Huh? I'm seeing a 2009 car going for 35,000 ringgit. And let me just try to limit it to the facelift. The facelift was launched in 2011, right? The cheapest facelift that I'm seeing here, 37, 36,500 ringgit, which easily you can bargain. 50. So they are going all going for about 35 to 50, maybe 55. I think, I think definitely all most also 60 but 60 is is overboard really you can definitely go lower than that so they're going for about 35 50 thousand ringgit and it's great car for the money uh but do be mindful that they are old if you buy a honda at that age besides changing all the fluids uh refresh the suspension because honda suspension parts are known to wear out quickly uh, have them refreshed so at least you will have a relatively problem-free car for a good two or three years or so. But let me let's just try and see how much does the new how much will will it be if you buy instead of the the eighth gen Accord, uh, the Padana. So I, and the thing is that now right you can buy even the those early batch Padanas right that were just like you know a, a Honda that's stamp out change new change bumper one. So they are also selling for about the same price. 2014 car, 41,000. 2015 car, 42,000. The thing you have to watch out for is that these were all government uh, fleet cars and uh, we do not know what sort of mileage and what sort of usage that they were on. But these cars were all not used by people who bought them with their own money. Um, so some of them will be well taken care of. Some will be rather abused. So uh, hunt carefully but let's just see how much would it be for those for the ones that proton uh, restyle so we look at the 2016 ones the cheapest one i can see 50, wow 52000 for a 2016 car it's the same price as the uh as the original honda model which is much older so uh from a wear and tear perspective um, those, the the last batch Padana, the one that Hon, that 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 Proton restyled ones, uh, those may be worth looking into. There's only one major design flaw of that car, uh, is the rear door. The way the rear door opens, right? Uh, there is that that edge there that is very poorly resolved. Uh, that's not just a design problem, it is a safety problem because uh, if somebody falls down and knocks his or her head there, that is a potential uh, injury hazard in my opinion. So I don't understand why Proton didn't, didn't look into that properly, the way the C-pillar float, right? the, C, the door shut line at the C-pillar, that was very poorly executed. But uh, this Padana, you know, in many ways, is a, it's enhanced over the Honda besides the design uh, because you get LED tail lights, um, you get pro projector headlamps, you get LED front signal lights, you get rear fog lights, which a lot, a lot of which which the original Honda didn't get. But um, mechanically, there is very minimal deviation, if at all, from the original Honda model. In fact, the suspension still followed pretty much followed original honda settings 
So it's because Honda didn't give Proton a lot of freedom to reconfigure the car. So mechanically, right, you buy a Padana or you buy an 8th Gen Accord. Underneath, you send to a mechanic, they look up, it's the same thing underneath. Right? The only difference is the design, the outward design, but otherwise it's the same. So yeah, there you have it guys. It's uh, it, uh, For you, KP Rim 14, a review of the uh, 8th Gen Accord, definitely worth going for, uh, but do budget an amount of money to, in addition to changing all the fluids, pay attention to the suspension because that is a well-known weak point for this gen for Honda cars in general and um, and try to get the facelift ones or the later batch ones because early ones uh, the early batch cars the brakes of those cars were not spec well enough for Malaysia usage so if you want to go for an early batch car you may want to look into upgrading your braking system to that of the of later uh, your brake rotors to late later batch cars all right yeah so that's it for today's video all right and uh oh yeah one more thing if you buy if you if instead of and if you buy a later batch version of this car 2012 onwards your car will be eligible for um evo club extended warranty so it gives you additional peace of mind when you shop for your car, all right. If you when you buy a used car, send your car uh, to any of our inspection centers. If it's approved, then you get an additional year peace of mind in owning your car. All right. Uh, there is a, a mileage limit. There's a limit age limit. All right, eight years, one hundred forty thousand kilometers. Uh, yeah, for you to qualify for this program, uh, you have to. You can buy it through us, Evo Club. Uh, at Evo Club, go to club.evomalaysia.com and you can book your your extended warranty package you can also uh renew your you can also purchase your insurance with us eoclubinsurance.com where uh we give you a, where we allow you help you to save up to 40 percent of your insurance costs all right uh for a mileage limit of just five thousand kilometers per year if you drive 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 then suddenly you exceed this mileage limit no problem just top up to the next level and carry on so you can think of this as uh, either a, a product that you can use to either save on your insurance premium if you are a low mileage user or if you're just a regular user but you know it is a means for you to stagger your insurance pre premium without extra charge or interest okay so anyways guys thanks for watching and uh Take care, take care out there. Stay safe. I'll see you in the next video. Cheers.